All right, so good evening, Year 12s. Um, we're now going to read The Passionate Poet and The Moon, which is the one that comes after The Passionate Poet and The Muse. And we're going to be looking for things that we know come up in, in Dobson's poetry, as we have been previously. And in particular, we're going to be looking at form and meaning in this particular poem, probably more so than we have in a lot of previous ones. So when we read this, I'd like you to pay particular attention to her punctuation, or lack thereof, and in particular, the reoccurrence of the moon, which we haven't encountered since the very first poem, The Fisherman and the Moon. The Passionate Poet and the Moon His candle steady flame burned on at elbow all the darkness through, and still he strove to celebrate, devising first the lyric forms, the huntress moon, her beauty, till scant light surprised the neighbouring hill. Thus, the first poet, there he sat, and every night his ardour burned companion to his candle flame. And every night the patient words in flocks were driven by his rage to the pale pastures of the page. The fickle moon who climbing watched his nightly vigil with his verse when all the world was lost in dream. Named him her shepherd and amused with this conceit, went climbing on to tell it to Endymion. Some say his death was destined, since his ardour and his art were vain. That unrequited passion kills, that poets anyway die young. I think the dreadful deed was done by that usurped Endymion. Let's continue to look at the imagery in particular here. We have a reoccurrence of darkness, and here she's talking about the elbow of darkness. And the candle, the flame, if we're looking at that as a metaphorical flame, we have this idea perhaps that his desire to create, his passion, his creative thought, his inspiration does burn through the darkness of, of inspirational void that she touches on earlier, that it will continue to burn despite frustration, despite roadblocks, writer's block that he, he may encounter. And perhaps we may see this as a little bit of Dobson's coming to terms with her own creative problems um, as she struggles to find a voice for her own thoughts and, and um, inspiration as well. So we're seeing here that he strove, that he wanted, he desired, and he worked really hard to devise the first lyric forms. Perhaps this is a universal struggle of all, po all poets as we see them. So let's look at this image of the moon here. In the very first poem that we studied, The Fisherman and the Moon, the moon was a little bit of a hopeless figure, was something that was focusing on desire that was with, outside her own reach. Um, remember the description of her was as this dragged moon as she came trembling upon the riverbank. Here instead, Dobson transforms the moon into a huntress. So it's a lot more predatory, a lot more proactive. And here perhaps rather than the inspiration and the creation simply just being on two sides of the same coin, they're bound never to meet. Here, in fact, the moon, which couldn't in turn be a metaphor for Dobson or poetry's own creation and inspiration, maybe here the moon is trying to pursue the poet or is trying to escape the poet. Maybe it's a little bit more active than it was in the earlier ones. We don't know, but it's definitely worth considering. So let's have a look at the role of the poet within this particular poem um, and the way Dobson utilises this poet as a speaker. Very similar to the previous poem, we have the poet and the speaker um, as a kind of everyman. The poet remains unnamed and in particularly, she's talking about the first poet, that this, the concerns and struggles of poet, poets to realise their vision and to come to terms with their own creativity and skill is something that's been around forever from the very first poet that she mentions here. So this struggle, I think, is something that she's confronting once again, um, where she talks about devising the first lyric forms, striving to celebrate something, and the fact that his ardour, which is another word for sort of passion and love and desire, has burned within him, something that she has touched upon in previous poems, but here it seems to be quite a lot more personal, a lot more passionate. And then we get this extraordinary juxt juxtaposition between the patient words that seem to be just waiting within the poet's mind, maybe at the back of his subconsciousness here, just waiting to be released onto the page. 
And in here, we get again a very active verb driven by his rage. Whereas previously in her poems, it was almost like a passive thing, that there was something dividing inspiration and creativity. Here, it's almost suggesting that we, that poets like herself, like the poet within this particular poem, must force the words out onto the page, that it cannot be a passive thing waiting for inspiration, that maybe it's something that has to be um, controlled by the poet. Maybe they have to take control over what they're own doing. Let's look again at the importance of form within this poem. She touches upon some of this in her earlier poems, but here it sort of seems to find its own voice and its own legs. Let's have a look at the final line of this stanza, the pale pastures of the page. We have very, very clear alliteration, and we think about the p sound. It's a popping sound. It almost sounds like an idea popping from her brain, or the, the words that are quite literally popping off the page. So think about words, again, adjectives you could use to describe this particular sound, um, and why she might have chosen to use that repetitive P sound in this final stanza. We also see, hopefully you've noticed, that there is the reoccurrence of rhyming couplets at the end of every stanza. Again, she's experimenting with form here, and we must ask, our, uh, ask ourselves why. What is she trying to achieve by having these rhyming couplets again at the end of each stanza? Does it create a sense of um, completion? Does it have a sense of beauty and finished, polished thought? Or is it, again, experimenting with the medium of poetry and maybe challenging it or fitting within it? What is she actually trying to achieve? Hopefully by now as well, you may have noticed her curious use of punctuation within this poem, particularly in the first two stanzas. We have no punctuation for the first four lines, and all of these lines are in jam, so it's a continued thought um, all the way through. And then, of course, we have the parentheses or the brackets, which almost is like an afterthought, a, a moment of explanation there. There's a very distinct full stop at the end of every stanza and here we have the ellipsis the three dots which suggests an unfinished thought which is a, a quite curious abnormality there and we'll hopefully notice in the final stanza which we're going to address in a moment that there is an increase of punctuation so why is she slowing her thoughts down here why is she separating them out what is she trying to prove has she come to some kind of understanding in this final stanza that she didn't have in the early ones so then let's look at the description of the moon in the third stanza. We've gone from this dragged, trembling moon of her early poem to now this huntress moon whose beauty needs to be celebrated in the first stanza of this poem. And here, the speaker of the poem describes the moon as fickle. Now, if someone is fickle, it means that their moods and their thoughts and their desires change quite rapidly, perhaps without rhyme or reason. So is the moon that this poet is hunting down so this idea this creativity this inspiration is inspiration equally as fickle does a poet perhaps have astounding moments of absolute inspiration where they can create these wonderful things and then months and months and months where they think of nothing is that perhaps what Dobson is um, suggesting here that sometimes they have this absolute triumph and celebration of the most wonderful thing and then maybe times of complete drought um, which she sort of touches upon in the previous Passionate Poet poem. And we get again the repetition of the idea of a vigil, which was touched upon in the previous Passionate, passionate Poet poem as well. So again, likening it to a religious ritual that poets continue to seek inspiration, continue to try to create, even perhaps in those darkest moments when they're finding it really, really difficult. So when they're talking about in the previous poem, when they're talking about repairing to that tree, that gives them lots of fruit and shade when things are working for them. And it's sometimes really barren and really, really bare um, when things aren't going so well. And she sort of has this similar imagery that pairs these two poems together quite well. Um, and again, She's talking about his nightly vigil with his verse when all the world was lost in dream. So is this when poets find or artists find their greatest moment of inspiration? Is it, in fact, at night? Curiously, when it's dark. Think about the first stanza. Again, look at the language that she uses in this third stanza where the moon is amused by the poet, names him her shepherd. 
So if she, that by naming him her shepherd and the fact that she is a muse gives her the power within this pairing. Whereas previously in The Fisherman and the Moon, the one with the power essentially was Endymion, even though he was asleep. Um, it was the moon that came to watch him every night, not the other way around. And it was her that felt bereft when they couldn't be together. Whereas here, the poet seems to be almost at the mercy and the whim of this fickle moon. So this idea that maybe poets are at the mercy of their own inspiration. That earlier on when Dobson was really young, she was like, oh, there's, there's inspiration, there's creative thought, and there's a barrier between, but somehow we'll come together or maybe we never will come together. Here, it's a little bit more active and saying we have to pursue things or maybe our inspiration makes us the slave of it. And here, rather than the moon continuing to come back to the poet, she actually moves, moves on and goes to her endymion. So we see that this inspiration comes and goes to this particular poet, but it's the inspiration that's in charge, not the other way around. Which then brings us to the final stanza. If we talk about this idea that a poet is a slave to their own inspiration or their own creative drive, perhaps, then it's quite interesting that she talks about his death. Whether this is his real death or his metaphorical death is completely up to you um, to decide and to support, absolutely. Um, so again, we get this repetition of the word art. And uh, sorry, Arda, not art, and then his art were in vain. So if something is in vain, it means that someone has pursued something to no effect, that they have tried and tried or they've, they've worked really hard for something and it's come to nothing. It really hasn't come to any kind of fruition. So it's a little bit of a, a sad way of looking at a, a, a poet's pursuit for his entire life that maybe he deserves his death because he's been so arrogant and, and hasn't actually realised his full potential. She then curiously uses the word unrequited. Now, hopefully we all understand what the word unrequited means. This idea that we give our feelings or our emotions to someone or something and we don't get that in return. So that his art and his ardour were in vain. His desire, his drive, his love for poetry came to nothing because it was unrequited by his own inspiration. He had all of these wonderful ideas, but maybe he couldn't actually put them down on paper in the way that satisfied him. So the inspiration that he had within his mind, maybe that didn't actually come out on paper. And so unrequited passion is this idea, maybe that his poems didn't live up to what he hoped them to be. Um, and that poets anyway die young. So there's this inspiration here. It's a slightly pessimistic outlook on the world, which Dobson doesn't really give us too often within her work. Is this a sense of pessimism? Is it hopelessness? Is Dobson perhaps saying, why should I pursue this? Why should I continue as a poet? We don't know. And again, that's something you have to consider. Is this a sad poem? Is it a hopeless poem? Is it a morbid poem? Or is it something that is just perhaps realistic and pragmatic? And saying, you know what, maybe my poetry will never live up to what I hope it to be. Um, and I think it's something that we really have to consider in terms of the tone and the style of this poem. Yes, it pairs with a previous one, but it's quite different in the way that it's structured and the way that it unfolds. Let's look at the final rhyming couplet of this particular stanza. I think the dreadful deed was done by that usurped endymion. Now, hopefully we've come across the word usurped, especially if you've studied Macbeth in mainstream English, you'll come across that word before. It means replaced and often forcefully replaced in some way. So how has Endymion been usurped by this poet? It's a very, very curious end to the, to the, the poem. And again, in like most of our videos, I'm going to leave that one with you. How has Endymion or the metaphorical Endymion killed this poet in some way whether that is a literal death or a metaphorical death again is completely up to you but what is this dreadful deed is it death is it the death of inspiration and creativity um is it the, the death of a poet's career i'm going to leave that with you and i want you to consider how these two poems work together let's look at the second stanza then and we're coming back to this idea of ardor like I said previously, it's this kind of 
um, synonym for passion and desire and fire. And here Dobson quite literally draws parallels between the burning of passion and inspiration with the literal flame of a candle. And she actually says quite clearly here that the passion of the poet is equivalent to a candle burning next to him, that they are both as fiery and as hot and as tenuous. So when you're looking at this particular section of the poem, this particular stanza, really try to consider adjectives that you would use to describe fire and see if you think that this maybe fits the feeling and the emotion behind this poem as well. Is it similarly fiery? Is it similarly um, intangible? In, not in a way that all the previous things were intangible, but in the way that we cannot touch it for fear of getting hurt.